Um, what I wanted to do this morning was to really start a conversation. We will be continuing this conversation throughout um, our um, uh, meetings uh, um, at the specs as well with uh, staff and with faculty. But to really begin to think a little bit about how do we conceptualize experiential learning for us specifically and for the university and for um, a way in a, for the future of, of the society and, and really thinking about how do we retain our preeminent position that we have had as being a leader in the field of experiential learning. And uh, what will it take for us to retain that lead? Because the reality is that while we have an exceptional product, if you will, that we, we uh, all deliver, um, the perception out there is uh, that this is not so unique. There are others who are doing it. Everybody else feels they can do it. You know, it's the same. I look at a piece of modern art, right? I, I look at Mark Rothko, and I think, well, I could have done that, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course not. But but that is kind of the initial gut instinct: is uh, a couple of dots on a on a on a canvas, and you're done. So, as we begin a, a conversation that we will. Um, also have at our faculty staff meeting uh, next week, I thought I'd like to set us off by just having an initial brainstorming session about what do we really mean by experiential learning in the context of Washington, D.C.? Um, what are the challenges that we face at this point that, uh, in terms of what our students need? Um, are we offering them something that is sufficiently diverse and relevant to when they go back? Because part of the challenge that I think we have is we have this great package that we offer, but it's not very well connected to what they do back in their home schools. And so while they individually become great advocates of this experience, they are not able to effectively articulate what they have learned and how they are learning it in a way that allows them to, to carry that message forward uh, more effectively. And so part as we're thinking about how do we keep what we're doing great and how do we keep it going and how do we uh, really also think about different audiences that we might be reaching out to. It's not only, we are no longer only getting juniors and seniors. We need to be thinking about experiential learning for pre-collegiate students. We're starting earlier and earlier. We also need to be thinking about folks like you and me who might be thinking about what relevance does experiential learning have for me as we continue to do go back to school, we continue to add degrees, we continue to add training and skilling. So I would just like to, at this point, open up the conversation. Um, I believe we have, well, we were supposed to have pads, uh, writing so pads, oh, yeah, writing no, pads. for people individually if we wanted to make notes. Okay. Well, we do have a flip chart. Um, I have pads. I didn't bring pads because I was right. under the impression they would be here. Sorry about I'll, that. I'll, I'll um, on but <laughs> if <laughs> you're professors, so you should have a piece of paper right? or an iPad, <laughs> whichever works for you. But um, I would say if you could just jot down, um, and this is an exercise that we've done before, but if you had to think of three words that encapsulate experiential learning, not necessarily exclusively in the context of Washington semester program, but really if you had to, if you were coming at this tabula rasa and somebody asked you to uh, make a case for uh, experiential learning, what would be the three critical elements that you think need to be in that? I've just asked people to put down the three elements that define experiential learning for you, not exclusively in the context of watch that. Okay. 
Yeah, you can use your mental pad too. <laughs> Some, limited, okay. <laughs> Some of us are. Uh, it was no. funny on the way, and I was listening to a report on the radio about um, new medical and personal fitness apps and, and all the new kinds of technologies and the fact that no one that, that, that there's one that you can put under your mattress and then with Bluetooth sends data about your sleep habits to your cell phone, to your smartphone. And the inventor was asked, well, what about security, data security? How do you maintain data security? And he responded and said, well, but it's just going from your bed to your phone. And he was completely oblivious to the fact that uh, that, of course, immediately opened it up to the entire universe. Dial NSA. <laughs> Chris Christie wants a George Washington Bridge app where he presses a button. Sorry, I didn't strap the program while we get hold of your data. <laughs> We are enhancing and transforming the liberal arts education into real world experience. And um, we're opening the students' eyes to the potential of their lives. And I don't understand, I understand why member schools don't want to understand that, but they really should because they are becoming more irrelevant than we are, I think. Oh. <laughs> I mean, really, they, they have to watch out. These little schools don't provide this type of experience. So they won't have any students. But remember, it's not just the little schools. So how do you how do you make that case to say uh, Michigan? They have their own program. Yeah. Well, but the, again, I said you know if you had to categorize right. experiential learning, so just uh, it's supposed to be warmer here. Well, yeah, <laughs> there is that. Yeah. Well, most of the like time. all of my students are from that's, old places. That's now. right, Christian. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to emphasize what Bill said in terms of relevance, the, the concept of relevance, the, the fact that we are helping students marry theory with practice. That the whole question of what marry theory with practice of, of getting them uh, to transition from the mostly theoretical academic world to the real world. And, and in the case of older populations, we're also going to, who have already been in the practical world, we can offer theory and, and we can tell them how theory applies to, to the practical world. Relevance, again, relevant education. B. 
perhaps enhancement or, or uh, career change. I mean, as as one matures, uh, perhaps thinking of different uh, you know different career paths, and perhaps we might for another population, you know, work on that. Um, I, uh, I'm thinking of kind of the marketing hat right now. I'm yeah. trying to think of the academic part of it. Yes. And, and for me, um, the words that come to mind are applied, mm -hmm. um, empirical, um, that theory of practice that, uh, that Christine was talking about, but it allows discovery learning uh, that's based on inductive ways of, of uh, going back to theory. Uh, recognizing patterns in, uh, hold on, I'm getting too many, yeah. getting too long, but these words. Three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have to teach um, you how to count. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but one is more practical, that transition to work. Yeah, transition to work, yeah. 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 Or transition back to work. Or back to work. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. bringing up. Yeah. Yeah. Mine is more from I guess a pedagogical standpoint, when I think of teaching mm -hmm. an experiential course that I'm teaching about issues of relevance to the global community. And through an experiential format, I can engage the students so that they become responsible for those issues and they want to work in those issues. And that it's more than just reading about hunger in India from a book, but it's going to the embassy or going to an NGO and seeing that people are hungry in D.C. Mm -hmm. And it's really engaging them to become more responsible learners to realize that they have a role in solving these problems. Mm -hmm. I like that notion of responsible mm -hmm. learning because yeah. we again part of think of what we need to be thinking about. What's the difference between experiential learning today versus 67 years ago? Some of that is that we are not no longer just standing in front of a classroom or at the head of a new tour group uh, pontificating, right? That we are expecting our students to take an active part in that. Two, two key words yes. that, that you might want to add to that to, to build on, on, on the brilliant comments that, that Beverly made right. are empowerment and, and actors. Our students are not just passive learners. They are active learners. They are actors. And we, we are helping them become empowered to, uh, to act in, in the real world. John, were you going to? I would add, I mean, it's just two things that came to mind. I couldn't do three. Uh, problem solving, because it's practical. Um, mm -hmm. um, Service because it aligns with uh, actually what AU uh, what, what AU does produce. I mean, there's one thing for what they aspire to produce, but AU actually has a reputation yeah. among other things for right. sending an inordinate number of students to the Peace Corps and other professionals. Mm -hmm. And they can want to be Georgetown, but they'll never be Georgetown. They can be AU. You know, uh, and we're part of it, so. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, Sean, having uh, ventured out into other parts <laughs> of the <laughs> campus, any any thoughts, uh, the, any different perspectives? Well, I, I really need to add a third. Sorry. <laughs> ah, agility. 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 Mm. Mm. Ah. Because right. unlike us, who will teach for a hundred years and don't right. fired. Yeah. Young people today have to be have to acquire the skills, the skill set to be able to change jobs, change professions, change disciplines. And so the big question is, what are those skills? How do we provide them such that they can navigate multiple careers through different, you know, through longer lives, basically. Sorry, Sean. That's it. I hate my third. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, and I guess I'm going to add on to your agility, <laughs> your agility and flexibility. Right. Yeah. That's right. Hi. Right. Flexibility. That we are, that we, 
that we teach them new ways of experiencing both learning and work. And in terms of my having ventured out into your class, I want to echo the engagement and the way that experiential learning generally connects students with, the, and some of it falls under the mentorship of put up on the board, went to a second part of it, is that what I have found with my SIS classes is I do not have the engagement with my students. And that has meant that has meant so much to me as a teacher and I think to them as, as students. I will engage with maybe twenty to thirty percent of the class in that same sort of way because they come to office hours and will stop me at that report. But I just don't have the same level of engagement with them. I think that is a major component of what is both offered through essential experience learning and is one of its greatest assets. And let me ask you, if I may, why do you, do, do you find that? Why is it that the SIS students are not as engaging as, as, as our students? I, I just don't have, I don't have the time. Well, okay, um, time. I, I am one of five classes that they are taking. They have five different professors. Okay. It's not a lack of interest, it's a lack of time. So, but, but so I would argue that, um, I would suggest that there maybe is a little bit of a semantic difference because when we speak about engagement, it's whether or not, I mean, there are two different ways of thinking about engagement, right? So there's the engagement of the student with the subject matter mm -hmm. and with the topic. And that could happen regardless of whether you're spending five minutes with them or five hours with them. Because yes. it, that's a, in par, a lot of that has to comes back to the responsible learner. If we have, in, if we have set the student up as someone who is, has a stake in their own learning process, then the engagement uh, would happen ideally from the student to the material with or without our intervention. Now obviously we play a critical role in that, but then there's the other aspect of engagement which is the faculty-student engagement. When, and there is clearly that's where our model has been very different from many of the other models. But I'm not sure that we, we want to be careful about collapsing those two into one single concept. Of and, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to collapse that, mm -hmm. I don't want to conflate those two, but I think there's also a tremendous value to the focus that yeah. SPECT has, has traditionally given students during that semester, the, it is an opportunity to be a responsible learner within a, an academic discipline that is sometimes lacking when they are spread across. Mm -hmm. I, and I'm all for a liberal arts education product of it and have taken advantage of it for many years, but there is something to be able to focus that intently on one of the areas. But in mind, most of our areas are cross disciplinary anyway, but with that ability to focus. There were a couple of hands up right hand. Uh, I also <laughs> mentioned that millennials are very visual. And so that that is one of the things we have here is that they see things. Mm -hmm. And so making it very emphasizing how visual the program is is very important. In fact, if you look right now um, at 18, 19, 20 year old millennials, they pretty uh, they do it off Facebook a lot. Yeah. Get onto Pinterest and uh, Instagram, or one of those, they're completely visual. Well, we've got a lot to show, and I think that's something that's appealing to them. Yeah. I was just getting back to Sean's point, having taught on the main campus, that I do try to integrate some experiential aspects into my teaching there, and at first, it was very, students would just look at me like, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> but by the middle of the semester, they realized what, what I was doing. I, I taught a class once in Civilizations of Africa, and I started out the first class not by just going over the syllabus and letting them go, but I went over the syllabus, and then I had someone from African, from a, a dance and drama come in, and they taught the students a dance that dealt with growing up in African society. And these students were like, this, you know, this has got to be the weirdest professor on the planet. But at the end of it, they were like, actually learned about growing up in African society from sure. this dance that this woman from the dance section. And they loved it because they don't, you know, they don't get a lot of SIS students over there and they thought it was great. Yeah. So I think we just have to come up with creative ways to engage students and whether that is through pictures or other visual ways. 
it can be done if you only see them three hours a week. It's just a little bit more work on our parts and a little bit more work in terms of preparation, but then in terms of getting them to accept what it is that we're doing. Because we are a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't, it was several years ago. Well, I did a, a similar thing I had. I was teaching a class in African public diplomacy uh, at one point, and uh, I brought in, someone had once given me one of these kids' puzzles, the wooden puzzles, with a map of Africa. And you had to then put in all the continents. Mm -hmm. And so I dumped it out on the table mm -hmm. and I said, Well, if you think you know, because everybody said, Oh, they're very familiar with Africa. This was enough for senior, seniors and, and first year grad students. And I said, Fine, if you're so familiar with it, do this puzzle. And they all looked at me and thought, you know, What kind of idiot are you making me do this little kids' puzzle? And every single one of them failed. Yeah. Not a single one of them could get the puzzle together. So <laughs> was your puzzle up to date, or was it uh, had things been changed? Uh, it was actually pretty up to date. I think there was one. I, they had they didn't have South Sudan in there yet, but other than that, it was pretty close. Somebody asked me about the Belgian Congo. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we were back to that at some point. If you wait around long enough, but anyway. Well, these are, so what, um, what I'd like to do now is drill, is drill down a little bit more on something, because as I look at this, I think these are all great concepts, but they can apply anywhere. So we now need to be thinking about two things. One is how do we really make these our own, and our, I mean, some of it we're already doing, but we, we need to convey that effectively. That's more of a marketing piece. but. It really is also a question of is there, as someone had mentioned, you know, service being something that is very closely tied to AU, is there the AU method of experiential learning that we think might differ from what other folks do out there? And how, where, where do you see some of those differences coming out? Um, if we were to compare our program to say what the Washington Center does or what another uh, internship program might do, you know, there are all kinds of internship programs at, even outside of D.C. Um, what makes our program, in your view, unique? Why, why is it, um, and someone recently said you can't have a very unique program. <laughs> you're either unique or you're not, right? So, uh, we're, but what does make our uh, uh, program unique? The second, the third question I'd like to get to then after we have a little bit of a conversation about that is on the content side. When I think about the term, where was it, relevance that Christian brought up, one of the questions that we are grappling with is do we have the right mix of topics that we are teaching? And if we have to start from scratch, what would we be doing? Uh, would we be teaching the exact same subject matter? Would we mix it up? Would we add other topics? Would we take some away? Again, thinking about this, uh, trying to get a little bit of a fresh sense. It's very hard for us to get out of our daily routines. And we can make an argument while we've been teaching the same thing for 67 years. It's done really well, why bother changing it? And that's a perfectly valid argument to make. But I would also argue that part of what may be happening is that we're seeing that there are a lot of changes happening on campuses around the country and around the world. And we need to make sure that we maintain our relevance to the topics and the issues that if we think about preparing people for career paths, what are the career paths that are out there that we may not be uh, preparing students for? And we can make choices. We can make choices about not, um, not teaching everybody everything. We will have to make choices. We clearly won't be able to, to teach everybody. So, um, I, I, excuse me. Well, I think playing off that, there are the two sets of questions. I mean, one, question or concern is what are the curricular units that we currently teach and how can or how or should the, the content and formats of, of those particular units be 
adjusted or revised to a, to reflect in, you know big letters change. That's one thing. The, the second set of questions is and, um, looking at both what our member schools and other schools do. I mean, I would you know you, you have to connect with it seems to me to two two pools of actors. One pool of actors are the, are the, sc the schools that are going to feed us the students. What is it that they're teaching? And how do we connect to that? As opposed to teaching something that's totally disconnected from the academic scene at, at those schools. And the second pool of actors is, is the marketplace. What are the kinds of careers out there or skill sets in existing careers uh, that, are, that are in demand? And I mean, frankly speaking, uh, you know, this is like a, out of my area. That this this seems to me to require like serious market research, it, to, to actually like find out, uh, uh, you know, on both ends, uh, mm -hmm. where you know where the trends are, mm -hmm. or where the stable. Uh, so I can do it on one cup of coffee. <laughs> 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 Just ran out of words. <laughs> yeah. Um, I agree, and I, as a recent graduate of an experiential learning master's here on main campus, mm -hmm. um, there are things that you are tangible that you don't need research for um, that experiential learning provides, and it's um, exposure to alternative scenarios. So if you can provide a space as a professor where we can gain experience in different results happening, then we are prepared for, you know, alternative scenarios. Or group dynamics is something that is taught in experiential learning that can go in any discipline that someone goes back home you know, after the semester. And um, mm -hmm. Beck and Ellis's um, from the 60s, the ability to uh, detach emotionally. So get outside of yourself so that you can learn what's in front of you and be able to choose what you want to do from, from being emotionally detached and then go back home to your state or town and um, do it. You think that works? Yeah, I do it. Oh, sure. Yep, absolutely. I do. As the first one of the first things I do the first day, tell them that you need to look at things from someone else's perspective. And one of the things I'll emphasize next week is that if you can write an A paper from the opposite perspective in which you believe, then you really understand the issue. Okay. So um, I learned from Rick. One of the things I do is I prepare my students for a particular issue and they're going to have a debate, both sides. And then as they walk in the room, I make them switch sides. you got to know the other side. Oh. I do something similar with the debate on the schools of thought. At first, I let them, you know, after the lecture and after we meet, we meet with five representatives of the five major schools of thought in American foreign policy, I ask them to write a paper. And I ask them to choose one and make the best possible case they can for it. And we have a great debate about it. And I tell them, you have to listen to all the other sides. And then on the exam, is make the case for the one that is diametrically opposed to yours. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so they made the case for, for, for their school, but in the paper. And in the exam, they have to choose the one that is diametrically opposed. And that tests whether or not they, they listen to the other sides in the debate. Right, because <laughs> we come with our own beliefs. So if you can get us to think in a new paradigm, that's the power. Of exactly. and, and if, if I may, I, mean, I have often done students, I do much of what we are hearing here, but in terms of, because I do capital punishment, I do gun control, and I have students that come to me and say, well, I might rephrase, you do capital punishment. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do well in her class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but, but the issue, and I've had students yeah. come to me often after the, well, toward the end of the semester and say, I still believe in capital punishment. I still believe in carrying my gun. But you have made me see 
the other side. And now when I go back to my, um, you know, my, my fellow students, mm -hmm. other professors, I can intelligently argue that other side to them. And they are, in, and, and they're, they're, they're very grateful to me. They say, we, we have not heard the other side. We are kind of ensconced in our beliefs, perhaps from our school, perhaps from our political, you know, scene within our schools that just looks at that this one side. But you've opened this up, and I think that, you know, that that's a, you know, I would think it's a yeah. good advantage. John and then Larry. You know, there's something inherent, though, in, in the, I mean, having taught both outside, you know, in other places and, and in other types of learning environments, there's something intrinsic about at least the, the Washington semester, that allows for the kinds of things that you guys are talking about. I mean, it's almost like we don't have to do anything special, or at least I've, maybe I've grown accustomed to doing what we do, and I no longer regard it as special. Um, the, the kids that are in our classes, they, they, they choose to come to Washington, so right away they're different. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they choose the particular unit or discipline from, from the menu that we offer. So, you know, there might be a couple of knuckleheads or experimenters, but, you know, they, they come from different backgrounds and schools, and, and, and they're trained, to, you know, in spite of what we think about our respective disciplines, the, the training and the depth and all of that is quite different from place to place and person to person. And, and, and inherent in what we do is the, the briefings with all of these different people. I mean, and, and we don't. I mean, I don't know any of you guys, and I certainly don't indoctrinate my students in a paradigm or a view. And, 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 and they come together, and they argue with each other, and they debate with each other. I mean, it, it, there's just something in the nature of the laboratory as it's been created for us that allows for these things to happen. Yes, yeah. If I may build on that. To some extent. I mean, yeah. all the different things you guys say that you do in the classroom are definitely, like I would call those, you know, like creative enhancements, but the program itself, I think, is... The structure of the program itself, and then if, if I may build on that, is it goes back to what Sean uh, complained about teaching in SAS and not having enough contact hours with the students. Uh, he ain't complaining, he'll lose his contact. Comment it, comment it. Strike that from the record. <laughs> comment it, comment it. You know, it's not having enough exposure, it's not having the students enough time. I mean, one of the things I do uh, is I have the students go to the National Defense University for a whole day long simulation, crisis management simulation. And you can only do that in the Washington Vista program because you have the students for a whole day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And you can literally prep them through the entire semester so that the, the last exercise is now you study all of these issues, now let's look at this scenario. And these guys at the, at the National Defense University put together some really very well thought through simulations. Uh, and they're not necessarily just war games. Sometimes it's about a pandemic. And how are we going to respond to a pandemic? I, I'm going to come out, Leroy had a comment, but just on that, uh, there are other folks around town that uh, do very effective simulations and make actually tailored simulations for the classroom. Mm -hmm. And we have, I, I've actually started a conversation with one group uh, to icons mm -hmm. to see whether we might want to incorporate them more into mm -hmm. our learning. And that's something you can do without committing a whole day. Uh, because it's an ongoing basis. It's a simulation you can do through the entire semester, mm -hmm. for example, so that you don't have to commit an entire day. So I just want to say, I want, I think we do need to think about different, we need to think about time in different ways than we have, that it's not just simply quantity of time uh, that allows us to affect all of these great uh, things at, at the end of the day. Leroy, you were going to... In, in talking to member schools and mm -hmm. in talking to member school students uh, and about their and, uh, in making contact, one thing that comes up time and time again is that students are eager, eager to engage in problem solving. Mm -hmm. right. um, and at the same time, uh, uh, one of the key things that they're, uh, that they're concerned about is jobs, right, is getting a job. 
Now, what makes us different from the Washington Center, right, is that whereas the Washington Center does four days a week internships, so they get the ant idea, right? Mm -hmm. Um, we have a blend of both the, the seminar and the internship so that we move them from the ant eye view in the internship to the 50,000 foot level super bird eye view and we move them back and forth so that they're given a menu of options for their careers uh, and the people that we meet with and also in terms of, uh, of their life options. So. They're not moving, uh, we're not a, a job placement agency, um, uh, although that is part of what we do, um, but we are uh, a, a educational experience which provides people with a, 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 an overview of the richness of the options in their life uh, and enables them to, uh, to combine those two of a full life uh, and also a full profession. <coughs> I think that we, we're completely different than, than the Washington Centers in the world in that sense. Not going to add to that. One of the things that we have with our seminars um, is that in, in the number of seminars, we have more connection. We can connect them with more people than other programs. How do we know that? Well, I can tell you from, <laughs> well, I mean, my, my view is that yeah. from, from what I hear from people downtown, they tell me this, mm -hmm. is that they actually prefer our interns over the others because they're much they have a much stronger foundation when they come in. And so, even though they're working less time, they have a much stronger substantive foundation. The same is true of our guest speakers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of guest speakers say, wow, yeah. we're yeah. Yeah. Great. really yeah. sharp, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah that is true. That is, that is absolutely the case. Gil, you were going to? Uh, uh, so many things, so, uh, so <laughs> I have Not enough coffee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one thing I want to say is uh, uh, we ca they come from so many different backgrounds, as I think John said, that uh, uh, finding a common core of what we're teaching them, especially in journalism, because we have so many people coming in with no journalism experience, mm -hmm. and some with lots of journalism mm -hmm. experience. Including the journalists. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, in, uh, what else? Was, I mean, I had about four or five different things, but we're uh, backed up, and now I've forgotten what they <laughs> are. Uh, but yeah, we do get a lot of diverse uh, uh, backgrounds, and the uh, what I tell my students is, if there's something in particular that you want to do, or somebody you want to meet, you tell me, and I will see if I can arrange it. And that's what you usually. I don't know mm -hmm. what you get that. <laughs> and I, like, I got the the Colombian into see the president of Columbia when he spoke at the press club, but wow. Wow. You know, wow. something wow. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just getting back to the problem solving issue mm -hmm. and then that students are looking for jobs and that's their main, yeah. their main motivation. And we know that the majority of jobs that the students are going to have in 10 years maybe don't even exist today. Yeah. Yeah. So we're trying to get them skills and all of this. So how does that coincide with the market demand and the content of our courses and what it is that we need to be teaching them? Well, it may not, fun it may not mean that we have to fundamentally change the content, but that we can complement what we offer with the kinds of practical skill set, uh, whatever, uh, add-ons. So, for example, uh, and AU, and AU does some of these things and does them well and has a reputation for doing them. So, for example, uh, you know, mediation training, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. like it's intensive sessions, whether they're weekend sessions or whatever, could be customized for our students so that whether they're, you know, it does, almost doesn't matter. Like this uh, woman was saying earlier, I'm sorry, I, I don't know your name, but. Uh, well, you know, that's Selena. So it doesn't really matter like what profession you would go into necessarily. What, I mean, you know, if you're in a management position, the, you know, the having some skills and experience, knowing how to mediate disputes or how to, you know, deal with grievances, um, it, it's, uh, it's applicable across you know, a very wide range of, of professions. I mean, that, that's just one thing. Uh, Bev was telling me yesterday 
that she's teaching a course or is, uh, built a course. Duck Tech, when you said that, I didn't know what the hell it was initially. I thought it was, you know, Duck Tech. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was like a new elliptical that I'm supposed to be using for my knee. Uh, so, you know, but knowing how, you know, know having a skill set that provides students with the know how to do, you know, monitoring, evaluation, gr grant writing, you know, anybody that wants to move into the NGO world has to know how to write a grant. Mm -hmm. and, and and that's a skill. You, and you don't experiment with that. Well, you can, but you know, you'll not get the first six grants you apply for. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these things, there's a long list of them, you know. Uh, I, I think we could really benefit from brainstorming just on that. Like, mm -hmm. what else could we provide the students with that other places don't, but we're not just doing it for that reason. You know, we're doing it because this would give them something that those all these criteria here you've been talking about. Jason. Yeah. And then the, the well, I think, you know, and I've taught a lot of the internship classes, but that's a great opportunity, not just with resume writing, cover letter writing, mm -hmm. but to talk about networking, to talk about the careers, to bring in a speaker from the Career Center, or uh, if there's a big interest in the class, because uh, I'm doing a GED internship in, say, finance and accounting, I'll bring in a, a relevant speaker, but you can really uh, hone in on those skills. Uh, in the internship class. Uh, I used to do public speaking in the internship class as well, like mm -hmm. a modified Toastmasters yeah. kind of thing in the internship mm -hmm. class. That was quite popular. Left Ferris. Gosh, so many thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to focus on maybe one or two things. Uh, John, I was going to talk about market demand, but then John would need to be uh, well, we can we can yeah, time time putting all of them up, not, so we, this short. is a, a brainstorming session. We can come back to something we talked about earlier, too. But definitely mediation is something we could I have shown if you're recording the time yeah. we've been proposed to SIS to have weekend mediation trainings, negotiation trainings, mm -hmm. post conflict simulations. Mm -hmm. I think they shut us down because they thought uh, <laughs> well, we lost the deal and kind of record what happened, but the whole thing collapsed. So it's actually kind of push again for it, uh, it might happen. But I'm going to go back to market, uh, market demand. I think it's, it's needed, it's very essential. And we move to, to new areas. I'm going to give the example of Silicon Valley, which it was proposed recently. And the other way, I think, has the highest, the, the largest class of revenue students by simply adding a further amount of, hey, let's go to Silicon Valley. And it now has the more the more students than any other program, with the exception of that ILO. Sean, I think you introduced ILO years ago. Uh, you introduce it immediately, 50 students going to your mm -hmm. I think you had 50, sometimes 60 students going. Mm -hmm. So that that's that's what I think uh, market demand is important. We need to do some kind of research. I remember it used to be PCR going to Northern Ireland, it had five students, then we changed it to South of the West, it went up to 28 students. Mm -hmm. So that's important, mm -hmm. let's not forget that. And so for a while, there were 30 students going to Northern Ireland. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. okay. maybe yeah. we need to adjust right. other things. And so, but this is, I guess, this uh, raises in my mind a question about is it that people are responding simply to something that's new? the next new hot thing it's, you know everybody jumped on the I mean, it's, uh, everybody jumped on the bandwagon of well we need to have flipped classrooms or we need to do uh, or students themselves saying well I, I want to be able to do uh, online uh, learning even while I'm in the classroom and there are various things where after a while they either stick with it or they don't stick with it and it just it becomes old, it becomes less special, and then it wears off? Or is it that there is something specific about, in this case, the travel programs that we identified that was connected to needs in the marketplace or perceived needs and interests among the students that made it that a hot new thing? My FBI, my I was just going to say, I think that if you have your core and you have other courses, and you mentioned the point of agility before, that you can adjust, you have a core, and then you have another set of courses where you can adjust 
then you can have both. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's part of it, is understanding is that you have a core and then you have another set of courses mm -hmm. where you can adapt and adjust. Mm -hmm. And then you, have, you get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. And then you, you have more options that are offered to students and you really do set yourself apart in the marketplace because you're keeping up with the trends, but yet you still have the basic programs there that run the same way. It's really something that's quite unique and no one else does. If I may build on that, if, if, if you have these core programs, uh, I can see some of these uh, the small seminars or small courses becoming part of those programs as well. In other a, a mediation week, a week of mediation training could fit very nicely in a foreign policy seminar or in an American politics seminar or in a justice and law mm -hmm. seminar mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and, and, and a crisis management you know, week can also fit nicely in, in almost all of the basic courses that we have. And that may be a way of doing it without having to have to go through the cut off of bureaucratic process and strike that comment. <laughs> this should be on the record, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, of getting course approved, right. you know, which, is, which is a, you yeah. know, quite, quite cumbersome. But that can be done very easily. You just say that this is an experimental course and they usually give you one. Yeah, let's not get bogged down in, in those kinds of, I mean, we, we, are, we know that we will be facing a hurdle of all kinds of bureaucratic issues and getting changes approved, but that cannot stop us from thinking about change and, and effective, affecting change. So I would prefer for us to bracket that and say in the perfect world, we could turn around <coughs> tomorrow and we could uh, do whatever it is that we want. And that's how we should be thinking about building the programs. And then we work back from that as we need to. Leroy and then Gil. This is in the packets that we sent out to us earlier, and I think that this is really a good set. That's just going to the right? directors. Um, the, the draft AU learning outcomes? Yeah, that hasn't gone to faculty. That's the only gone to deans and directors. Oh, well, it's, it's, in, it's, it's in the series. Series. Oh, it's oh, in these it's folders. Right. Okay, good. Oh, oh, right. I, what, what I was going to say, yeah, hand it out next week. But that's fine. I can talk about oh, that. Okay. <laughs> um, but a couple of them, like effective communication, across cultural communication, I think is an important skill as we globalize, right? right? Yeah. And as we become more diverse societies, that everyone has to be able to do the kinds of things that, like Dan was talking about, switching perspectives, right? Or right. that Dee was talking about, yeah. about uh, gun control and seeing both sides. I mean, one of the things that we, I, I think that we should be very proud of is the fact that Paul Ryan, and Patty Murray, Paul Ryan being uh, a Washington uh, 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 alum, right, were able to come up with a, a, a solution so we don't have another government shutdown. And, you know, I, I think we should be very proud of that. Anyway, that, that effective communication area, cross-cultural communication, I think, includes understanding other perspectives. The other one that I wanted to highlight, and I think that, that Bev has been doing such great work in this area, but I think that we should do more of it in our classes, the kind of that online learning uh, or computational learning in, in our classes is the, the, the heading that says digital information and computational literacy. Uh, I don't know how many of my students, and you know I'm a big fan of Google Docs, have come back to me and say, you know, I, have, I went into the work world and I used it and I would never have known how to use it if it hadn't been for the class, right? Um, and, or, or simply uh, uh, with, our, with the databases that we have at the library, that we use those more effectively to not just print out tables, but how do you extract data? Um, not even big data, but how do you use the OECD databases? How do you use the World Bank databases? to understand what, what, what trends are going on out there. Can we call that research work. competence? Can we call that research competence? Yes, I think that that absolutely should happen. It should be important. Uh, there was a, Gil, you were going to I, I just had this wackadoo idea. We're talking about crisis management and why not, we could have a whole, not a whole class, but an exercise in which the American politics and foreign policy come up to crisis and the journalism students go in there and, uh, and report it. And, and, report it. <laughs> and they have to come up with their spin and we have to break it. Yeah. <laughs> and I can see some really interesting uh, stuff that we can only do because, as Christian was saying, we are flexible enough that the journalism group can go work with the foreign policy and the American politics group because 
we all know each other and we're not. Yeah, and we talk to students from three days to a week. Right. And, right. Yeah. Just the Christian, you used to facilitate those with the uh, um, National Defense University? Yes, of course. I remember yeah. that to this day. I learned so much myself. Yeah, yeah. Those, yeah. One of those. those were wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you guys um, as uh, on, on that point uh, two things. One, if we did not have the current set of um, concentrations, tracks in the School of Professional and Extended Studies. If you had to today come up with a core set of fields, whether they're multidisciplinary or single topic issue areas, what would you think are your top three fields that a student needs preparation in today in order to be prepared for the careers of the next several decades? That's question number one. Question number two is, um, we have been mostly focused, as which I understand is natural, on our undergraduate populations. If you were to take that up to that same question to our age group, younger, older, you make the span as wide as you want, uh, would that answer change? Because I think that's part of what we need to be thinking about again. If we're thinking about is there an AU approach to experiential learning, thinking about what is it that we're teaching, not just in the way in which we're teaching it, uh, but also what, what is the actual substance, the content that ought to be taught? And are we as a liberal arts university, fundamentally a liberal arts university, are we able to teach what needs to be taught? Uh, we may or may not have that competency in-house currently, so you should be thinking about it more broadly. What is it that students need to take away? both at the undergraduate, traditional student aged population as well as the adult uh, population. I bring you some slightly different perspective. Yes. I'm a director of academic and disability yeah. support. Moving, and, and most recently as I've worked with a counselor, I'm working with graduate students. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I, I work with a lot of, I've sort of developed a specialty for getting students who have comprehensive exams who take them, who failed them the first time. And if I think the one trend that I have noticed with the students who have not been successful to the different way of looking at it is the inability to sort of understand, first of all, why they're taking a comprehensive exam, and the inability to sort of understand, um, you know, the connections, it, and the connections into, like, see divergences, like you know, what I call it higher level matrix reasoning and thinking. You know, extension of ideas and discernment among like higher levels or abstract thought, and and I think that's something that really you know to me is expected in the graduate level of thinking, and so I think that needs to you know to be taught. Or some students may not get it for developmental reasons, but you know the ones who are missing it are missing it for reasons. So let me do that. <laughs> <laughs> Not for much longer. That is what I got out of my master's program. Is the higher learning. level yeah. reasoning. And I do, I mean, if we look at what employers want, one of the key things, you know, we talk about critical thinking, but what does that really mean? What do we mean by critical thinking? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that, yes, everybody can train someone to build widgets. We don't need to have universities for that. And part of what the, the issue that we're grappling with is that there are a lot of for-profit entities out there that do training. We are not just doing training. We are trying to get folks to that level. And that, in part, is, I think, the story that we need to be not only telling, but, in fact, acting out is that uh, we need to be able to take people, as Leroy, you had mentioned, from that ant eye to the bird's eye view and back and forth. That requires an ability to extrapolate. It requires an ability to connect among things that may not be necessarily connectable or that not readily connectable. Uh, and it does require us to think not just about description, 
but actual analytics, I think. And, and so part of what we will need to be thinking about in all of our courses is to what extent are we training that skill? And analytics could be anything from data analysis to conceptual uh, analytics to content analysis. But simply having people going and visiting with uh, 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 going to a site or visiting with a speaker in and of itself we know is not enough, right? Anybody can go downtown and do a White House tour with Alice. So what we add a certain extra element and that, that, that the secret sauce kind of that comes from being in an in institution of higher learning. Let's come back then to, are there, uh, just for the last, I think we need to, what time do we need to finish? 10.15. 10 so we have about uh, six minutes <laughs> left to just do some brainstorming on if you had to, at the sort of mainstream student um, area, um, quiet. Um, what do you think students need to know? What are the fields that you think are, are ones that are, uh, that have, cons and you know, there are fads, but there are fields that have been consistently relevant and important uh, and, con and will continue to be. So let's look forward to this. I mean, because of our location, uh, our comparative advantage will always be government, politics, justice and law, uh, foreign policy, international relations. This is Washington. This is where those policies are formulated. So the students are going to come to Washington and this is where the experts in, this, in those fields are, are here. So we cannot ignore that. Uh, so I think we, we have to keep those, those basic things. Journalism, of course, is always crucial because they, they cover everything. Now, what are the new fields we can think of let me just um, question you on this. Um, research shows that the number of job openings for political scientists is decreasing at a, gla at a, at a uh, not glacial speed, uh, at a terrifying speed. It is increasingly more difficult for political scientists or people who have studied government to find employment even in public policy and in government areas. Because what they're looking for are more data analytics, they're looking for economists, they're looking for uh, a variety of different cross-disciplinary fields. So I would just put a little asterisk that, you know, it may be that the, the topic areas are still relevant, but we'll need to think very carefully about how we prepare and how we complement what other schools are. Remember, we're not the only ones teaching these students, except at the, at the adult level, there will be a, a different, uh, uh, different engagement with the students. But if you have a traditional political science student coming in, uh, what do you do with that student to give them that edge? Just I, I think one of the things that we do in our classes, or at least one thing that I do, and um, the students tell me that it really helps them is, is that I don't assign regular papers, I have them do research meetings. And so when they are applying for jobs, they tell me that this makes an enormous difference because they have the experience of doing memos, doing research memos, getting right to the point. And this is a skill, I think one of the things that we do here, that a lot of people don't know, and it gets back to the mentorship point, is that we really work on their writing skills. And this is something that's really critical today, is because people will say, I will have nothing to do with you if you can't write. And I mean, that is, I mean, I teach them, I literally have a grammar guide that I'm in the class for them. And this makes an enormous difference. And so whatever job they're applying for, I am teaching them skills that are applicable in other areas as well. Um, as I'm looking at the, the topics here, I'm wondering if there's ways that we can tweak 
even the names, just to make them a little bit more sexy. Even if we're still doing that writing, we're still doing all these other things, but you know, just to make them so they're more marketable, really. And um, for instance, international environment and development. A lot of my students from SIS are, they're all about environmental management. They're all about this whole fracking thing. So is that a way to sort of tweak IED to make it so it seems more practical so that we would get more students? Or instead of peace and conflict resolution, um, conflict resolution and human security, or just like buzzwords that are just seem a little bit more sexy that maybe bring some of these more practical skills. I don't know. I mean, our content is still going to be much like this, the same, but you're kind of tweaking it a little bit and making it seem like we're giving more practical, I don't know. No, no, no. Maybe I'm talking out of nowhere. I don't it's know. not making it seem, making them realize that what we do is practical. Yeah, so it's not just American yeah. politics, no. but it's something. I think we did change it to American politics and policy. Or yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. And it isn't sexier, but it is broader. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. John, uh, left there. Sorry, let me go to left there and then come back to you. I, I, I don't, I don't know if I can subscribe to the to that sexy. completely <laughs> or to those topics completely. I mean, I'm going to go back to the caveman days and think. <laughs> it's, if I sort of start from the beginning, there's there's government and politics. There's business and economics. There's sort of, I guess you could say, societies and, com and communities. And then there's communication. And I think there's, within those broader rubrics or whatever you want to call them, then I think we can do the following things. One is to see you know, where our current units fall. So you find your cores and where, where they fall. Yeah, where, where yeah. they fall. If, if they fit. Uh, two is is to see what kind of connectivity there can be between them um, and, and, and should be, both in terms of content and how we do business. So for example, um, it's hard to really talk about international politics in the real world without talking about business and trade. And so there may be ways to partner seminars or develop activities, which some of you guys were suggesting earlier, uh, where we don't where we don't have to change the content of each unit, but where we synergize, I hate to use that word, though, mm -hmm. where there's an interplay between the two. It's funny because everybody says, I hate to use that word. And then you use it. Left there is. One topic that comes in mind that goes away from the traditional thinking, something along the lines of, the lines of uh, science, management, and technology, which we don't have anything related to. Again, this is a course. And I know we're going in the public health direction, but that's also a big issue. Yeah, public health. Yeah. Uh, things that uh, traditionally we have not looked at so far. In addition to what we have, and I know it's annoying we have to be that we have to think about the time that we use. We have to be keeping focused on the way we are. We're running out of time, but very quickly, Christian and Gil yes. and Leroy. What, what very quickly. I wanted to make our time to make the four was. <coughs> Uh, another topic, of course, is cross-cultural or intercultural communications. And I'm thinking out loud here if one possible solution to this idea of having a module on, on this topic or a module on, is if we could use our evening electives, you know, the specs evening electives, so that for instance, we have at least one, if not two or three units of intercultural communications offered to all of our students. And we kind of push the other ones who, who don't have to do the research project to take those classes because we think that those classes would be essential to dealing with each and every one of the different disciplines that we teach. You know, so you would we have, have to keep going, but yeah. I, I don't want to interrupt, but that's, that gets to a level of practicality that we're in. Right now, I want to stay on okay. substance. Sure. Hey, if there's so many things to say, but I just want to make one point. Yeah. And that is that um, I think it's cool if you set it up or maybe it was just software that Equinar is applying for higher education that. Um, what employers are looking for is people mm -hmm. who do complex problem solving in teams, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's something that we all, all offer. Um, 
the point that I wanted to make on that is that I think that we shouldn't throw liberal arts overboard too soon mm -hmm. because that's what gives us the ability to do that abstraction. Right, and, and I'm not. Uh, and I think pre-2008, what we had was that liberal arts uh, and complex thinking were what universities were expected to do. It was with the with the economic crisis uh, post 2009 that we that was that there was much more of a panic and people were uh, moving away from doing uh, uh, that complex thinking to job training institutes. So uh, I I think that we have to avoid overreacting to the business cycle um, and, and and keep in mind what it is that we do well. Um, we, we we shouldn't be too uh, too much uh, color of the day. I, one last point I want to add is that my training was in international relations and political science. And I'll tell you, it gave me the best training to do what I did for most of my career, which is 20 years in the business world, uh, working with Fortune 500. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm a political scientist. I'm not saying, you know, I don't want to diss political scientists at many, all, where many, I are for that many matter. Many people but are I, in business. Some of the leading yeah. venture capitalists, they were, they were a trained in, in, in political science. So I don't think that we should throw the baby out with the bathwater yeah. in terms of just uh, into the current trends. Very quickly, this is not related to journalism at all. When I went to Rylands 40 years ago, the biggest major was uh, history. Now the biggest major since at least 2001 is international business. Mm -hmm. And when I uh, read the resumes of the, our international business students, I was just blown away. Uh, they're so good. So I, we really have to do everything we can, I think, on the internet, because that's where we get everything that we can do here. Uh, and it seems to be one of the biggest things that the students want to um, I keep thinking about something he said, I just want to say it. He said, John, right? Um, he said, we give them grant writing skills. Everyone needs to know how to grant write. And know that the first five times you try, you're going to be rejected. So not only are you learning the skill of grant writing, but the skill of dealing with the rejection. <laughs> How to fail well. <laughs> I mean, I think that's what students need to learn. It's like, it's not about me that, that I got rejected. It's, this is, this is what happens in the real world. Like, As I said at Media General, you try anything and you can fail, so fail fast and fail cheap. Gentlemen, people, thank you very much uh, for everyone. This is an ongoing conversation. We will continue it. We did not get to what we teach ourselves or our age cohort. I hope to be able to get a little bit more information about that and whether these are the same things that you would be teaching us. Uh, or a mid-career or an executive level person. Um, so hopefully we can continue those conversations. And I think others who joined the discussion, uh, we welcome more and more input at any point in time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs>